Welcome. All right. <clears throat> Let's take a look at evolution, communities, and species interactions. As we go through this lecture, this chapter, we want to think about how all of these things connect. So how two species interact with each other influence the community dynamics. So are you predator? Are you a prey? Are you working symbiotically together to benefit each other? And as your species do this over time, you're going to be evolving. So all of these concepts are all intertwined together. You can't pull out one and say, oh, it doesn't connect to the other. So that's why we're looking at these as a group or if you want to say a cluster of ideas. How does evolution influence communities? How do communities influence species interaction? Or we could approach it the other direction like we did just a minute ago. But something to keep in mind. In order for a species to evolve, the trait that you're looking at must be inherited. It's got to be in the DNA that gets passed from generation to generation to generation in order for that to cause the population or the species to evolve. So please, I will stress this, and I hope you've had it stressed to you before, individuals do not evolve. Individuals can adapt but evolution is over time. So when we take a look at some definitions here, I want to make sure you guys are really comfortable with the difference here. So adaptation can be picking up picking up a trait that allows a species, or we could even see it in an individual, to survive. Now, because you picked up this trait, let me move this over, does not mean that you're going to evolve. It just helps you survive. I mean, the odds are if it helps you survive, you're going to pass it on to your kids. If it helps your kids survive, they're going to pass it on. That's where we get into evolution. The species changes over the course of many, many, let's add one more, many generations, and the species is what's changing, causing those species to become different and eventually different species. Okay, so natural selection, hopefully again, this looks kind of familiar, I've heard it before, that's the idea proposed by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. And in their idea, the fittest, or we could say the most adaptable individuals will survive oops, and pass on their genetics. Then their offspring survive and pass on their genetics and so on and so on and so on. So that's what we're talking about when we're looking at the difference between adaptation, evolution, and then how does natural selection play into this picture. Okay, so one of the things that will also fuel these changes, as we mentioned earlier, you know, the change, the trait, the whatever it is, needs to be inherited. Something that leads to potential evolution are mutations. So if a species, oh, let me get this, if a species has a mutation, a change in the DNA of the species, then it potentially will have an adaptable trait. It may be beneficial. Great, means you're more likely to survive. Now you're considered fit. You have children, your children have the trait, and that keeps going on and on and on. You might get a mutation that kills you, done. You're out of the gene pool. Well, not gonna evolve. A lot of mutations though, we just don't see anything happening. No benefit, no harm, just a change doesn't really impact it. So let's think about this on a small scale, something we see a lot of in the healthcare field right now. Mutation with bacteria. So our little red bacteria pick up 
some kind of mutation. They change. Their DNA is a little bit different, and it makes them resistant. So now you punch those bacteria with antibiotics, and it wipes out most all those yellow ones. Who's left? The fittest. Those two little red ones. They reproduce. They have kids. You're hitting them with antibiotics again, but their kids are resistant. So then they produce grandkids that are resistant and great grandkids and so on and so on. And what we see is this jumping from generation to generation and an increase in the resistance of this particular population to a specific antibiotic. Now keep in mind in the bacterial world, the generation might be 20 minutes. So natural selection and evolution can happen pretty quickly in certain species. Other species, it might take thousands of years to see any noticeable difference just because of the generation time. All right, so we want to remember mutations play a role in evolution. They play a role in what's considered fit and not fit and so on and so forth. So in the big picture, evolution looks at or I should say evolution produces the diversity of the life we have on our planet. You know, there's 1.8 million estimated potentially 10 million species out there. That diversity is a reflection of the evolutionary process over the course of the existence of life. So as species are evolving, they adapt to different things we call limiting factors. And every species adapts to a different range of limiting factors, which enables them to survive in a given area. That's what enables them to survive in specific communities. So this is where evolution is going to connect into the community. But let's get a couple more terms under our belt, just some basic terminology that hopefully looks familiar. All right, limiting factors. These are going to be anything that Let's call it a factor. Oh, let me get that down there. Factor that influences species survival. I'm going to change our font size here a little bit so that way we can get in a little easier. Let's drop that down. There we go. Okay, so any kind of factor. Now, these factors, let me put a couple of these down here for us. Factors could be abiotic meaning non-living, so things like rain, sun, temperature, pH, just etc. You could create a huge list here. Or they could be biotic, diseases, predators, food, slash prey, etc. Again, there is a huge list there of things that could be considered biotic limiting factors. So you need a certain amount of food, you need a certain temperature, a certain etc. Those are all the things that you have to have to survive. If they're not there, survival is compromised and it's much, much more difficult for you to survive. Now, often we'll say, all right, within that category of limiting factors is a critical factor. Critical factor is the limiting factor that is in the shortest supply. Like, oh no, there's not a lot of this one available, but I really need it. So we go, okay, there's your critical limiting factor. If that one disappears, it may wipe out the species, or if that one changes, it may significantly impact the species. Where if some of the other limiting factors were to change or adjust in their prevalence, it may not significantly influence the species. Species might be able to adapt and be just fine, but critical factors, those get a little more concerning. Now, all species have what we call a tolerance limit, the minimum and maximum range of environmental factors that they can oh, they can survive. All right. oh, 
All right, so give you a quick, easy example. Consider pH. Every living thing has a range of pH that it can survive in. Let me put that in here as an example. What about temperature? What about water quality? There's our environmental connection, etc. Again, that list can just be huge, but everything has a window. So you look at the picture below. We're talking about these butterflies. The butterflies like to be within a certain range. So they have what they call the optimal range. This is their happy, pot, happy spot, sweet spot, whatever you want to think of it. This is where they do the best and the population grows the most. There's a zone of physiological stress. Uh-oh, we're not so happy. We have it on this side. We're not so happy. We still can survive, but notice our population's really gotten small compared to here. We're not doing so good. And then the zone of intolerance. Uh-oh, we are not able to survive in that zone. It's too dry, it's too wet, it's too acidic, it's too basic, it's too whatever. You've pushed them out of their zone, and again, they go into what they call zone of intolerance. Species can't exist there. So if those environmental factors shift, they're out. We'll talk about this when we get into ecosystem indicators, or we call them indicator species. Oh, wow, if you have this in your environment, that means you have good water quality. If that species disappears, the water quality has shifted one direction or the other, and now the species is in their zone of intolerance, and they've disappeared. So it's warning signs when we see these species decline because they've hit the zone of stress, the environment's moving them further and further to the right or to the left on this graph, and eventually it's going to push them out. So again, it's one of those big flag comes up saying, hey, this is a problem. So that flag coming up saying this is a problem is, is important for us to think about. And that moves us into our next picture here. What do all these species have in common? You take a look at them and you go, okay, well, there's a honeybee. Um, we got a frog over there, those little oval-shaped things. Anybody recognize those? Did you guys say euglena? And then that insect to the bottom right, that's a mayfly. So all of these species are what we call indicator species. So they are present in very specific environmental conditions. Um, in a lot of cases, we use indicator species to monitor the health of ecosystems and if they're there present in specific if they're there it usually means you got a good ecosystem the concern is if they disappear or their population starts to drop and they get pushed into that zone of stress and then eventually a zone of intolerance, that's a huge flag. That's a huge signal. There's environmental problems going on. Um, so we use a lot of factors, a lot of different variables to identify good environmental conditions. And we'll be getting into a lot of these things throughout the semester and different topics and units. But uh, indicator species are a really, really important biological factor to keep in mind that, all right, honeybee populations are disappearing. Some species of honeybees have now gone on the endangered species list because their populations are going down. That is a very, very concerning fact. Biologically, they're telling us the environment around us is not healthy anymore and their populations are suffering, which will have huge impacts coming back to humans. So what we'll do in the next lecture is we'll start talking about species, ecological niche, generalists, specialists, and all those factors that we associate with different species in a community.